drawing your attention to the, some of the forms that are on your tables. This little half sheet, this little half sheet will tell us an important thing. Whether you wish to be confirmed, received, or reaffirmed. Let me tell you what that means. If you have never been confirmed in a church of any kind, then I would love for you to be confirmed in the Episcopal Church. So for most people, that is actually what they would be doing here, is, go, is preparing for confirmation. Confirmation in the Episcopal Church is an adult profession of faith. Because we baptize infants very often, confirmation for us most of the time is when a young person is old enough to actually claim their faith. And so as adults, if you have been baptized but never confirmed, please do check confirmation because this four-week class prepares you for that. That will be the second week of November here at St. Michael. And if you cannot be here the second week of November, then we can have you confirmed anywhere. So don't stress about that. We'd love for you to check confirmed. If you have been confirmed in another tradition, then you can be received here into the Episcopal Church. So if you've been confirmed in the Catholic Church or Orthodox churches or Lutheran or Presbyterian or wherever, then you can be received as a confirmed member of this church. If you have been confirmed and you are currently a member of the Episcopal Church, you can go through reaffirmation. That is a wonderful way to simply say in whatever phase of life you're in, you reaffirm your faith and you reaffirm your membership and your participation and your engagement in the Episcopal Church in this particular church. This is especially helpful if you've gone through a major life event or if perhaps you're married to someone who is being confirmed and you would like to join them, you could be reaffirmed. For a lot of people, if they are maybe married for the first time, maybe they're divorced, maybe they've had a loss or any of those things, reaffirmation is a wonderful way to just take stock of who you are and where you are and recommit. Any questions about those three designations? Yes, sir. So confirmation is separate from, in a different tradition, would be just straight back and that's a separate process? Yes, if you are not baptized, then I am very excited because I love baptizing adults and we would love to baptize you. And so if you've never been baptized, no shame at all, let us know, we'd love to do that. If you are baptized as an adult, you technically are a confirmed member. It really, you don't have to do both. Confirmation is really an adult profession of faith. That being said, it is nice to have a little ceremony for confirmation. And it's my hope that you actually get to be friends with some of the people in this room and you'd like to do it together. We have probably all had the experience, if not ourselves, we've seen others who come to church regularly and they sit by themselves. There are certain people who really love to sit by themselves. There is nothing wrong with that. If that is your choice, more power to you. I would love for you to actually have friends that you see and might sit with, and these could be your people. And if you are looking to perhaps share the pew with another person, then here are some other people. And so I encourage you to get to know one another a little bit, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time before 1.30 where you all can just visit for a few minutes because that's nice. That's the whole point of church. Church is not kind of making sure you get into heaven. That's not it. Church is really about sharing your life with people who help make you the person God made you to be. And that's really what the community is all about. Did that answer your question? Yes, I think so. Thank you. Other questions about these statuses? I see both of you. Nancy, go ahead. No, unless you'd like to do reaffirmation. So that's up to you. If you're simply transferring, no problem. Um, but if you'd like to just participate with the class, then reaffirmation is a great thing to do. It's nothing more than being part of the service, walking up, and the bishop takes your hands and just says, we reaffirm your member and status and engagement here at St. Michael. So that's up to you. You can transfer without doing reaffirmation, but you're invited. Sorry, one second. What if you were um, christened as a baby in a Methodist church? 
So you have to decide. We do not re-baptize people. So we occasionally have people who come and they say, gosh, we love this church and we really want to be a part of it. I was baptized in a different tradition and for any number of reasons, I don't want to be part of that tradition anymore. I want to be baptized here. That's really nice. We don't do baptism again because humans don't baptize. God baptizes. We just speak some words. And so once you're baptized, you're baptized. It doesn't matter the tradition. Christened, I don't know exactly what that means. We don't christen. Typically in other traditions that christen, it's a promise to raise a child to allow them to choose to be baptized later. And so that's something you'd have to gauge for us. Typically christening, some people use the word christening here because they were raised with that word. We don't christen, we baptize. And so someone might say christen, but actually it was baptism. So you have to decide whether you were actually baptized or you were just promised. A true christening is a promise to raise a child. So it depends on whether it was a true christening or if it was a baptism that they called christening. So think about it. Because if you, need, if you really don't know and there's no way to find out, we're going to baptize you again. Hallelujah. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Easy. Easily done. Easily done. Yeah. Uh, is this day in November the same day that you would also do an infant baptism or is that something different on a different day? Yes. It's actually, well, no, sorry. We are baptizing people the first Sunday of November, and the bishop is coming to confirm, reaffirm, or receive the second Sunday of November. The first Sunday of November is All Saints, and so that's like a, that's a big baptism day. And so if you've got a particular uniqueness in your schedule, just let me know. We will talk about it one-on-one. We, we will figure out what to do. So no, no pressure. Final questions? I'm going to do about 1,800 years of Christianity here in just a minute, so we good? Okay. All right, so this first class is the history of Anglicanism. Can everyone see this well enough? Um, the slides are only so helpful, and it's easy for us, good over there? It's easy for us to send these to you. Um, so what I want to do is I want to talk you through the history of the Anglican church, now, we're going to start off by saying we use the term Episcopal. That is simply because we are the Anglican Church in the United States. The Anglican Church in the United States is called the Episcopal Church. In other countries, it may be called the Anglican Church. So, for example, the branch of the Anglican Church in Canada is the Anglican Church in Canada. I will answer right now that the reason we don't use the word Anglican is because the Episcopal Church started in the years immediately following the Revolutionary War. And it was not perhaps ideal to be associated <laughs> with England. And so rather than calling ourselves the Anglican Church in America, which would have made all the sense in the world, they wanted to use a different word than Anglican. Episcopal means a church with bishops. So oftentimes you may hear the word episcopate. The episcopate is the bishop's seat. And so an episcopal church is just a church with bishops. There are other denominations of Christianity that use or incorporate the word episcopal, and they typically just mean because they have bishops. So it also adds to the confusion that in the U.S. there are former Episcopalians who use the word Anglican to essentially mark that they are conservative and they have not gone along with certain shifts in the Episcopal Church, whether that's women's ordination or the like. Although they use the word Anglican, they are not directly connected to the Church of England or the Archbishop of Canterbury, which is essentially what defines the Anglican communion around the world. And we can get into that if you really care, but if that's the first time you've ever heard of anything like that, don't even trouble yourself with it. It's not that important. Okay, stop me anytime to ask questions. We're going to start with the conversion of Britain. Actually, I'm going to take one step back. First century, Jesus lives, dies, resurrects, ascends, he's gone. His disciples then spread out all over the world and begin to plant churches everywhere. 
those disciples have disciples who have disciples, and then the church spreads. You get the linking of the church with Rome under Constantine and beyond. Around the year 1000, 1054, the church splits east and west. That's when you get the Western Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox churches. Fast forward, essentially, well, we're going to stop there. So in that first thousand years of Christianity, as the church is spreading, there are certain leaders within the church that send uh, priests and other people to save different groups of people outside of what would have been the known world, the Roman Empire. In 597, St. Augustine, we call him St. Augustine of Canterbury, which is different than St. Augustine um, who was in North Africa. St. Augustine of Canterbury is sent by Pope Gregory I, or Gregory the Great, to spread Christianity among the heathens in Britain. Because at that point, there was no Christianity there, or not really. And so St. Augustine sails from France over to England and lands at a place relatively close to the French coast with a short span of the English Channel named Canterbury. And so St. Augustine plants his life and work out of the little town of Canterbury. As Anglican Christians, we believe that the Bishop of Canterbury is essentially the head of the Anglican Church because Augustine anchored his ministry in that coastal town of Canterbury, which is kind of southeast coast of England. Even though today the Archbishop of Canterbury lives in London, we still kind of hold that position as the figurative head of the Anglican communion around the world. So Augustine was successful, and he began to spread Christianity throughout Europe. In 1066, you've got William the Conqueror and the Norman conquest of England that really kind of spreads what we understand as kind of European ideals into England. And that is really when the Christian church in England begins to spread because it's connected to the power structure of the group that comes across from the continent of Europe. Fast forward another few hundred years, and in the 14th century, in the 1300s, there is a theologian named John Wycliffe who is teaching in England. Now remember, there is no Anglican church at this point. This is all still Roman Catholic. John Wycliffe begins to reimagine Roman Catholic theology and begins to ask questions. Why does the church do this? Why does the church do that? Couldn't the church believe? And kind of begins to create a different way of being Christian than the Roman Catholic way of being Christian. Well, John has quite a few students, and John's students begin to spread this idea. John, one of John's students is Jan Hus. He's a Czech theologian. Jan Hus goes back to the continent of Europe and begins to teach his own students many of the ideas that Wycliffe taught him in England. What this does is that plants seeds in both the continent and in the UK of a different way of being Christian than the Roman church. Over the next few hundred years, there is a, an evolution of these ideas that we then begin to call reformed theology. The key idea, however, for us is that there are two major reformations. There is the continental European reformation that we can call the Protestant reformation. That's the one most people know. That's Martin Luther tacking up the theses. It's John Calvin in France. It's Ehrlich Zwingli in Switzerland. There are a number of key theologians that all begin to challenge the power structure of the Roman church, essentially north of Italy. So you've got Germany, Austria, Switzerland, France, that kind of stuff. All of those theologians are sharing ideas. And so there's a lot of overlap among the Protestant reformers because it's easy for them to share ideas. Over in England, it's not quite as easy for them to communicate with each other. And so you've got a different set of reformers in England that simply diverge in much of their theology 
from what's happening in the main continent of Europe. So there is a fourth branch of Christianity that spr springs up about the same time as the Protestant Reformation, and that's the Anglican Reformation. There are a lot of people who wrap those two reformations together. That's a little lazy. The Protestant reformers do, and I, I mean, there are whole volumes and volumes of books written about this, so I'm gonna do this in 45 seconds. The difference between the two reformations, in my opinion, is that the Protestant Reformation was really a reformation from the outside in. So the Protestant reformers didn't like a lot of the practices of the Roman Catholic Church. So worship shifted in some meaningful ways in most of those traditions, as did many of the practices, like selling indulgences and things like that that we've heard about from the Middle Ages. In England, it was more a reformation inside the church, and so much looked the same. Many of the practices looked the same, but the theology really began to shift. And the best way I can give you an idea of how the theology shifted is that the Protestant reformers still had a very similar goal to many of the Roman Catholic Orthodox theologians, which was, we can answer the questions you have about the world. So if you have a question, we can have an answer. And they would work really hard at defining a really thoughtful answer to any of the questions we have about the world. In the Anglican Church, they really didn't seek to answer all the questions. I like to say, if you've got a question, we're going to help you ask a better question. We simply cannot know everything about God. And so our starting place is, we cannot know God's whole mind. We can try, we do have to make some decisions, we do have to do some stuff, but whenever we do anything, we leave the door open to learning more, to having more revealed to us about the way that God works in the world. There are many ways in which you can see this playing out in America right now, where there are certain traditions that say they are very certain what God would say about anything. You know, God would say this about X, Y, or Z. They're certain. Much of that certainty is anchored in their primacy of the Bible. Everything you need to know can be discovered there. We certainly say the Bible is important. Of course it is. But we also believe God continues to reveal truth in the world through us. Our discipleship and our faithfulness and our communities help us to continue to understand God more and more fully. If our starting place is not, we are right to know everything, it's a whole lot easier for us to say, maybe we didn't know that, and to make a change. The classic example is women in ordained leadership. At some point, the Anglican Church, the Episcopal Church said, actually, yeah, why aren't women priests? We should do that. And it didn't happen quite that quickly, but <laughs> in a sense, theologically speaking, the door is open for us to continue to learn more about the way that God functions in the world. That often puts us in conflict with those traditions that would like to believe they already know everything. And so the rigidity then makes our desire to be flexible through God's revelation a bit problematic. Questions about that? Super high level, I know. Yes? So for those coming from maybe one of those traditions where you know, so it's the Torah or focus on the Bible and what you're talking about, what is kind of like coming from those traditions if the excuse me, if the uh, the evangelical red flags go up so say, mm -hmm. like what's kind of the balm that you kind of like could explain, well here's why we can approach it this way and it's valid and good. If that makes sense. Sure. Well so I can answer that in many different ways. The first answer I will say is always the easiest, which is we start with Jesus. And if we find anything in the Bible that seems to contradict Jesus, we got to go with Jesus. We are Christian. And so much of what you see as rigidity in other Christian denominations is not based on Jesus. It's based on other parts of the Bible, whether that's Old Testament, which, I mean, that's just, there are many problems with that, given that it is the Old Covenant, not the New Covenant, so that's relatively easy. But others would be Paul. 
And so you read a letter of Paul, and Paul says a certain thing. Well, first off, Paul's historical context was very specific. He was answering questions that certain people asked him about a certain way of being in a certain place at a certain time. We can't then extrapolate that to universal truths forever, especially when what Paul says does not quite gel with what we see of Jesus in the Gospels. If Paul seems to be saying one thing and Jesus seems to be teaching something else, we got to go with Jesus. Jesus is, very simply put, difficult because he doesn't give us a lot of detail. We like detail. Jesus says, love God, love your neighbor as yourself. How and when and which neighbor and what happens if they're a jerk? I mean, you know, there are all these different things and what happens if they hurt you? I mean, on and on and on. Well, if Jesus' life does not answer that question for us clearly, I'm not entirely sure what else we need. I mean, Jesus literally allowed himself to be killed. Could Jesus have stopped that? Of course, he's Jesus, but didn't. So in that example of life, we are basically taught how to be. And so if we are not doing that and we're choosing to do something else because, say, Paul or James or whomever said something, Mm, they're nice people, they were doing their best, but they're also not Jesus. That is super open-ended because Jesus didn't give us much specificity about anything. And so we have to go back to love again and again and again. And that just forces us to be flexible because love cannot be rigid. Almost by definition, it cannot be. And so for people brought up in traditions of rigidity, I don't believe that the people, well, what am I going to say? Um, <laughs> I don't believe that the people who participate in those traditions are doing so with a lot of intentionality, are trying to limit the way they see the world with a lot of intentionality. I do suspect that many leaders are creating boundaries around certain ideas that reinforce their own authority and their own power but those are the leaders. And so I don't fault the people, but I do think that part of what we try to do here is remain open. If you're starting places we don't know everything, then you're far less likely to find yourself pushed into a corner where you are behaving in a way Jesus almost certainly would not. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. So Thomas Aquinas is brought up here. So unless you're a primo nerd, you've probably not read the Summa. Um, Aquinas was a completely bonkers, brilliant lawyer, basically. Thomas Aquinas essentially created canon law as we know it by creating an ethical, legal connection to theological ideas that is still wildly impressive. Um, there are actually stories of Thomas, who, um, who is supposed to be um, like a giant fat man who would just sit and dictate these ideas to people who would write for him. So the whole image to me is great. But Thomas essentially created this legal structure, and as we all know with law, if you make a particular decision, it ripples out to other decisions. And so the Roman Catholic Church, if you ever looked at a Roman Catholic catechism, it is a chunk, it's a tome, because every decision impacts other decisions. So there are certain decisions that we may look at, the Catholic Church makes, and we say, what the heck? Why would you do that? Well, it's because 18 decisions ago, they had to decide in this particular way, which means that that decision has to be this way so that it maintains a very strong ethical foundation. The Anglican Church essentially says, we're not legal. I mean, let me, let me say this as charitably as possible. It might be that Jesus' principal message in his time was that the law will not save you. You could essentially summarize everything that Jesus taught as the law does not save you. Because what he was walking into in the first century was hundreds of years 
of Jewish people doing their absolute best to try not to find themselves separate from God again, the most important moment in Jewish history, potential, I'm going to say yes, is the exile. When the Jews were taken into exile by Babylon, it rocked their entire world. And they began to ask the questions, did we do something wrong? What they decided was God is consistent and good and strong. We are the ones that did something wrong. So when they got out of exile and they rebuilt their temple, they began to put a whole bunch of laws in place to keep them on the straight and narrow. They knew they could be tempted to do other things that would then separate them from God, and they did not want to do that again. And so they created an an absolutely incredible legal structure to keep them very, very much on the path so that they were not separating themselves from God again. Well, Jesus steps into that world of absolute rigidity, and he says, you are missing the point. The law is not a bad thing unless the law keeps you from God. And Jesus over and over again says, it's me. God just wants your love. God just wants your soul. God does not want you to follow all thousand plus rules. And so I think it's very important for Christians to not accidentally do the same thing. It's important for us to not put a whole bunch of rules in place that are very well intended to keep us on the straight and narrow, but they then become the idol. And we forget that it's Jesus who saves us, not our following of the law. Does that make sense? Yes. Sorry, mm-hmm. I was asking a simple question. Uh, I never give a simple answer. Uh, historically, how do you arrive to the open-endedness? Oh, you just mean like who decide? Like who in history made those choices? So like Mr. Cranberry? Yeah, so... From John Wycliffe, we get a lot of students. And ultimately, those students land with one guy who is probably the most important name I want you to know, and that's Thomas Cranmer. Thomas Cranmer was in charge of the church under Henry VIII. Henry VIII, as we all know, got sideways with the Pope because the Pope would not annul his first marriage. Now here's an important note. Henry was very faithful Catholic. So Henry was not some sort of like loosey-goosey guy like he's often portrayed to be. Now, I mean, he's not a great guy, but let's just say he's not, he was trying to do right. He was trying to follow the rules and he needed a son, an heir, and he wasn't getting one. And so he approached the Pope to do a thing that was very commonly done, annul the marriage so he can get remarried properly and within the church structure to then try to have a son. Well, the Pope, who did not like Henry, said no. Thomas Cranmer and some others who had been learning, who had, uh, what, could, what should I say, who had prepared for centuries at that point an idea of what the church could be, that the church could be better than what the church was, saw an opportunity. Henry was not getting what he wanted from the Pope. And so Henry got mad, and his bishops said, we don't have to be connected to the Pope. We can do something else. So essentially, these theologians, they did not respond to Henry's desire to get an annulment. They seized the opportunity for the political will that Henry had to have in order to separate from Rome. Does that make sense? So the theological ideas of the Anglican Church had existed at this point for 150 plus years. They just, you know, priests and bishops have no power. And it's not until the king wanted something done that it could actually happen. And so they were ready at the right time to seize on Henry's desire to get what he wanted from the Pope that the Pope was not giving him. Make sense? Okay, let's keep going. I do want to point out that there are lots of, I know you can't really see this, but let me just explain what this is. Essentially, you've got multiple different groups that we know that have split over the years. So up here, you've got the Catholic Church at the very top. 
And then in the 1500s, there are multiple splits. You've got the German split over here, you think like Martin Luther being in community together because it's our accountability to one another that really makes us better. And makes us, when I say better, I mean more and more the people that God really wants us to be. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, when I was very young, my, my mother's parents, my uh, maternal grandparents were very strict Presbyterians. And so I received a, a copy of the James Version of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And um, it was difficult to read to me. I, I wondered, there's a lot of traditions of Bible that I know there's the international version and a number of others. Is there one that, that you are most comfortable with that we should be reading? So the King James Version of the Bible is a, a lovely poetic translation, but it's a translation of a translation. And so the accuracy of the original language is really not there. Now, that being said, I'm still going to have Psalm 23 read in the King James at my funeral. So I just, I love it. It's great. Um, so don't like feel guilty if there are pieces of it that you really like. But if you're looking for a translation that is most accurate, the most accurate version right now, and it's what we read on Sunday mornings, is the New Revised Standard Version, NRSV. The New Revised Standard Version is the most accurate translation right now. The NIV, the New International Version, is a very good translation. The NIV is a little easier to read. The NRSV stays pretty rigid to what the language really said. And so as a study Bible, it's very helpful. But if you're just sort of reading your Bible without the study component, the NIV just softens and smooths a little bit of the weird language occasionally, and they do so in a very faithful way. So the NIV is the most readable and accurate of all of them. But if you are looking for a study, the NRSV is the most accurate translation in English. And what they do if you get a study Bible, HarperCollins is probably the best one to use, you will see a ton of footnotes all the time because for example, there are four different words in Greek for love. There's only one in English. You kind of need to know, if you're really studying, which form of love are they using here? Because it totally changes the way you would perceive or learn from that passage. And so the NRSV is quite good at that. I also want to tell you, if Bible study is relatively foreign to you, which it is to most people, I also recommend getting a paraphrase to complement your translation. A paraphrase is a very thoughtful, faithful interpretation of what the Bible says, not a translation. And so the most common one, I think the best one, is the message. The message is not a translation. I want to be super clear. Do not read the message and stop. <laughs> read the message to help you then go read the NRSV. Because there are plenty of passages in the Bible where if you're just reading along, you're like, what is happening right now? I mean, who is talking? What are they talking about? These words, it's redundant or repetitive or often bad grammar. And so it's difficult to track what is even happening. The message is very helpful. Read the message first, and I guarantee you'll say, oh, that's what's happening. Okay, then go read the translation, and then you can actually dig into the complexities of translation when you get the big picture of what they're really talking about. And so it's often nice to have both if you really would like to study the Bible because it gives you context that is super helpful. Any other questions? Thank you all for being here. Appreciate it. If you have a question about the forms on your table, please let me know. If you've not signed in, please do sign in. And feel free to leave the forms on the table when you go. I will collect them here in a little bit. And you do not have to rush out. We are fine. So if you want to visit a little bit more with some of the people at your table, feel free. See you all next week.